we are celebrating the the African contribution to the HIV response with a, a group of um, I don't know how to define them in any other way legendary warriors. Uh, I'm in awe of the work that uh, these women and I'm, I'm I want them to introduce themselves. But before I I do that with much anticipation. I really want this to be their space rather than uh, you hearing my voice. I just want to say that um, there might not be many people joining us here, but this uh, um, webinar is recorded. And I really want to share whatever we're going to discuss today with many women uh, and men as possible. I think it's fundamental that we start finally, constantly, and regularly, and as often as we can, that we start um, conversations about uh, African heritage contribution to the HIV movement. But also, for me, it's even more important that we start, we move from the dominant narratives uh, um, and the excluded voices uh, towards a center where everyone uh, is acknowledged for the contribution they are making and they have made. I am going to do something which is really kind of school teacher kind of style. So I'm going to call each of the uh, participants here and um, ask them to introduce themselves. And then I will ask uh, some questions which will focus at the beginning very much on the brilliant, amazing, fantastic book that I have co-produced with many others. I'm not getting any royalty from the book, but it's a must. This book has to be read not just from the perspective of us, women live with HIV, or from perspective of activists, but everyone else that is interested in uh, compassion, empathy, leadership, change-making, must read this book. I'll start with Rebecca, because she's uh, the first person in front of me on the screen, and is one of the legends. Would you Hi. like to introduce yourself, Rebecca? Thank you. Um, my name is Rebecca Mbewe, and I think for the benefit of this particular webinar, I'm uh, one of the co-authors of the, Our Stories Told by Us. My day job is research assistant uh, with Queen Mary, and I'll leave it there and pass it on to the next person. And the next person could be Memory. Hi everyone, uh, sure there are a few familiar faces in the room from AATG. Anyway, my name is Memory Sachikonye, also one of the co-authors. Uh, my day job is uh, working for the UK CAB, which is uh, coordinating the network of HIV treatments in the UK, and also working for Positive the UK, where I'm the admin and finance lead. I'm also a long-standing member of uh, DMAG at AATG. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Winnie. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. My name is Winnie Saruma, and I am one of the co-authors. Co and uh, my day job, I do international development work, mostly monitoring and assessing uh, community health and um, social enterprise projects in about 20 countries in Africa. Thank you. Charity? Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Charity. Um, my day job at the moment, I am in hospitality and um, I'm one of the co-authors. Thank you. Last but not least, Angelina. Thank you, Nicoletta, and thank you very much for having us on the call. So my name is Angelina Namiba, and I wear very many hats, but um, the main one is I work as a project manager for a small charity called the Forum Network of Mentor Mothers Living with HIV, whereby we train, skill, and mentor women living with HIV to support their peers, but also for their own personal development. And I do many other things, but I think I'll end it there. Thank you. Well, shall we start? Because we mentioned this book like it's a bit secret. So <laughs> who wants to, to start by telling us uh, what this book is about, uh, how it came about, how this um, developed into something uh, that is simply a magnificent piece of work? 
Angelina, do you want to start? Yeah, sure, of course. Thank you so much, Nicoletta. So, I mean, why this book? Why now? Um, there's so many reasons why we decided to write this book, but I think I'll just focus on the three main ones. Um, the first reason is, you know, oftentimes whenever we hear or read about African people living with HIV, it's usually negative. We are portrayed as statistics, as passive, voiceless victims and recipients of services. So we wanted to change that narrative. We wanted to change the narrative to highlight our achievements, to show our resilience and to celebrate our leadership. This is often unheard and unseen. We also wanted to remind people that we've always been here, equally leading and contributing to the UK HIV response. We wanted to show stories of hope and what we could achieve together and through those stories, we also wanted to promote some critical messages about people updating their knowledge about how HIV has changed and also challenge stigma. We wanted to do a lot of things, but we also wanted to amplify our voices, tell our stories in our voices, in our words, in our way, thereby ensuring that we shaped correct representation in our correct in history. Because if we didn't do it in our own way, in our own words, somebody else was going to do it in their words, in their way. And for this reason, the book is really unique. It's the first of its kind, which tells the narrative from the African perspective. And last but not least, one of the reasons we wanted to do it, why now, is because we wanted it to coincide with the 40th anniversary of the discovery of HIV in the UK. You mentioned, well, a couple of questions before we, because I want to talk a little bit more about the book. Mm. Um, is uh, almost a year old, so quite a lot has been happening uh, since uh, since the book came to to light, uh, and we had the opportunity to to share um, all the different nuances of experiences that you described in the book. Mm. But um, because this is a setting which is very much European wide setting, and um, you mentioned each uh, of the in the UK. Do you think that the experiences that you shared in um, in your book, and I'd like uh, us to kind of hear more from the mm -hmm. book, um, is it something that can be shared uh, Europe-wide, or do you think that there is something that is peculiar, specific to, to the UK? It's not peculiar at all. In fact, I, I mean, I'll start, but I'm sure the others have lots to add to it as well. It is something that can be shared globally, because our experiences as African people living with HIV we, you, we cannot extrapolate the African out of it. So you could be living in Geneva, you could be living in wherever, anywhere in Europe, but our stories don't differ that much. Of course, the only thing that is different is maybe the healthcare systems might be different, access to services might be different, but actually a lot of the stories within the book, because a lot of the contributions are from African people who migrated from different countries to come to the UK, but it's not, so different from African people living in any other country in Europe. But I'm going to stop there and let somebody else uh, pick up the thread. Um, well, then uh, I'm going to ask memory. And the reason why I'm asking memory is because memory is very familiar with uh, the ATG. So um, memory, how do you think that the following on what Angelina just told us, how do you think that um, your work uh, talking about the book in particular, can inspire women of African heritage in Europe. Think about our members to start with, but also visualize other women you might know in Europe. What are the key messages, if any? Uh, yes, and thank you for asking. We think, or personally, I think that, you know, women's stories are not, have not been told. And in EATG, we can uh, count the number of uh, migrant women from different countries and, if, and the number of African women in the organization. They, uh, you can count maybe on half one hand of people who actually speak up. And I always wonder why other people don't speak up. They're not necessarily all from the UK. Migration is, has, been, uh, has gone high in Europe since all these disturbances in other countries. And uh, those are the voices that we want to capture. So if we, if they read what uh, we have shared, they will find similarities in our experiences and hopefully they'll get inspired and be able to tell their own stories in their own words. So my thinking would be is something that if we can find 
maybe a subgroup of women, migrant women, and see what they can take back to their countries of residence to try and encourage women to share their stories and their experiences would be a great idea. Is memory is the, that's a brilliant idea? Thank you. But I was thinking as I was listening to you, is the experience of being a migrant what comes first, or is the experience of being uh, African um, of African heritage that comes first? Because I'm also a migrant uh, to the yeah, UK. Yeah. yeah, there's an intersection there. Of first, you are a woman. Two, you are a migrant in a foreign country. You probably have no power that you probably had in your own home country. And three, the stigma. Every, cul every African culture or even some uh, other cultures, there's stigma, which is very rife. So you are in a, you know, in a foreign country and you want to talk about your HIV. I've heard stories of people who cannot say that because they think it will affect their, you know, their immigration uh, approval or status. And also are, are quite uh, afraid of isolation. There are people, in the UK, unfortunately, that, that I know, who have been kicked out of their church, uh, churches where they were meeting their community, where they felt included in their community just because they have shared their HIV status. So there's a big story about stigma that needs to be addressed as well in all communities, especially in other countries where the Black people are fewer. UK is different. There is a quite a big number of uh, Black people living in the UK. But if you go to small countries like, uh, I'll take an example for Norway, even an EATG membership, how many people from Norway do we have? We used to have one African woman, but then she went quiet. So these are, I feel like these are all people being lost. So I'm going into DMAG mode, but I'll try and stay <laughs> on track. But you know, there's other countries that have very few women. Who do they network with? Who do they talk to? Who do they share their experiences and stories? We don't know that information. So it could be something that we can do a little sub project or just a survey to women in EATG and find out how they, they've managed or, or managed to uh, manage to handle or integrate in their communities uh, where they live and whether they have any say in what they are doing in their lives or get involved in making decisions, get involved in uh, communities or boards of HIV decision-making uh, people in their own countries. Thank you. Um Winnie, I'll come to you now because I'd like to discuss more um, st stigma. We we always talk about stigma, the experience of stigma, internalized stigma. Um, tell me more. Tell us more about stigma from the perspective uh, and uh, that you shared uh, with other in uh, in the book. Uh, thank you, Nicoletta. Um... Stigma is one of the big themes, you know, uh, that came out of, of, of the book. Um, and uh, we know that generally also in, you know, in the HIV world, it is a big challenge. Um, but it was really interesting uh, within the book that it wasn't um, only the people living with HIV talking about the stigma. There were other people in terms of our allies, in terms of our friends, in terms of people working in the sector. Literally everyone in the book talked about the impact of HIV-related stigma. So it is a big deal. It is something that most people living with HIV have experienced at different levels. Uh, and uh, it is still an, an ongoing issue. In terms of writing the book, we were very clear that if people contributed stories uh, to the book, we wanted uh, them to be able to have a photo in the, in the book. We wanted their real names in the book. And uh, I'm afraid that excluded some people because there were a few people who were unable to do that. So we wouldn't be able to include them. The reason why we wanted people's photos, people's names, people's stories, 
you know, raw, pure stories coming from the heart in their own words is to play a small role in reducing the stigma attached to living with HIV. So I believe that we can build on that and, you know, go out there and encourage others to write their own stories um, and not be afraid because we've done it. And it is something that has been well received and we are really privileged and happy about that. Thank you. That's why I call you change makers, because you have paved the way so others can then follow in their own words with their own experience. Um, talking of which, I am looking for Rebecca, because I want to know more about how does it feel to, to, to start thinking about writing a book and writing a book with uh, your peers, because it must be such a powerful experience from the beginning to end. And even now that the book uh, is a year old, tell us more, because I'm really jealous and I want to learn more. Um, in hindsight, we can say it was a wonderful experience because as, as we journeyed through the whole thing, I don't think uh, we've come to this end actually let me rephrase that we can appreciate now where we are and what a beautiful journey it's been but whilst we were going through it we we wouldn't have been able to articulate how and what is required because none of us had ever written a book before um so there was a whole process about how we went about it um, i'm sure it'll come up you know, later on when we have conversations, there's five of us on here and each and every single one of us comes with their own strength. So um, the idea was brought to the table by Winnie um, and this was through our ongoing sort of, through the pandemic, we continued to meet each other and um, at one of the events after the pandemic, Winnie attended, she was asked, um, and Winnie can articulate this better than me. She was asked, well, where's the African voice? And, you know, what can we do about this? And so she brought the idea, guys, we need to do something. And the conversation started from, let's write a book. Okay, how are we going to do that? We put together a steering group um, and, you know, huge acknowledgement goes to Mark Santos of Positive East and Michelle Croston who lives in Manchester, who wrote a book. So they guided us, they managed the money um, because we as a group of friends are unable to do that. So there was a whole process and um, suffice to say the fact that we're still here, we're still friends, we're still going. Um, yeah, it 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 was a really, it, it's a passion project. It's something that we did from the heart. We never set out to make any money out of it. We just thought we need to have our voices heard. And this was a really beautiful way of, of showing it. Um, I said, Winnie's the ideas person, memory's the money person. She will mm. always ask you, how is that going to be funded and where, how much it will cost us? Um, Angelina's the project manager. So, you know, she tells us what to do, when, how, and where to go. Um, Charity is our creative director. And she can tell you a little, a lot more about her designs and the beautiful cover that's there. And I'm the resource person, so I tend to yeah get you whatever you need from wherever I get it from. Don't ask, otherwise I'll have to shoot you. But there you go. <laughs> but yeah, thank you. That's great, Charity. Tell us more about being the the creative uh, soul. Um, and mind and person in um, amongst this group of amazing women. Think you're on mute, maybe. Yes, you're still on mute. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, um, uh, Nicolette and everyone. Uh, well, I were, when I was asked to create the design for the this book, um, I felt an immense passion. And 
this project was a chance to own our heritage and also our journeys as Africans and the contribution to to the HIV response in the UK. So it was vital for the artwork to reflect our heritage, our journeys as Africans, equally important as um, acknowledging um, where we are in our journeys here in the UK, uh, writing about our contributions. So when I was asked, it was, uh, I had, it was a long process for me. Uh, I had to research for fabrics, um, which would uh, go with the, the stories, the themes. And uh, so I chose uh, vibrant colors. I didn't want to choose any other color, which uh, didn't mean anything. There are so many beautiful fabrics out there, African fabrics, which yeah. are beautiful. But for me, I just wanted something which would resonate with our stories, you know, the tips tapestry of African fabrics and uh, so I chose uh, the ones which resonated with the book so every single piece of the artwork in the book is uh, the has got a meaning we wanted something meaningful so it's got a meaning and I believed uh, we succeeded in producing a, a book that we as a group of authors are incredible proud of and it's a book that calls out uh pick me up read me a book that uplifts and up uplifting and speaks of our growth and development in many areas a book we created uh in our own terms as uh in uh the other authors mentioned earlier. So uh, it took a long process. I had to cut some of the uh, fabric to create the trees. I don't know if we have to show the, the designs or not. Well, if we can, that would be great to be able to show the design because I think it's important, for especially for those who haven't uh, read the book, because that <laughs> As as I'm listening, I can um, I can visualize the book and it's next to it's oh, next okay. to me on my desk. But for others, we, we want people to buy your book and read your book. I think they have to buy the book. So I I think today I'll just make it short. How uh, I can uh, uh, um, describe the design. So the book has got the, this blue yellow cover design, which is called tsunami, which is symbolizes how um, HIV impacted our world and how we have rebuilt strong, we have rebuilt stronger and more resilient communities. And then there is a tree from which from the grotto pattern of Cote d'Ivoire, uh, which represents social recognition, and each leaf tells of our strength, growth, and uh, unity. Yes, and unity, facing stigma. Thank you, memory and the Julita. And the birds uh, in uh, in Anfen fabric, Anfen fabric. Thank you, Angelita. Meaning palace of com or community, uh, which stand for family, community, and support. And then the map of Africa and UK. I use the fabric called. Uh, and then it reflects the highs and the lows of uh, our journeys, showing we can thrive and even in hard times. So uh, finally, there is a continuous line which flows um, below the at the bottom of each page, symbolizing our our deep connection and uh, the core of Ubuntu. I am because we are. That's all I can say for now. 
Well, I think you have said that something that is really almost magic and very, very powerful. And I think that that resonates with uh, um, every single person that is, in this instance, living with HIV, but in many other instances, you know, when you build community, that's the power. And that your book speaks exactly that language. Mm. I, I'd like to learn more um, about the book from the perspective of building uh, community and building leadership. Because this book is, as I said already, but I want to repeat it, should be read by those who don't know anything about HIV, do not know anything about, not just because of the learning process that can go with the book, but I think because they can learn a lot. They can learn about leadership and community. I can ask, um, I'm going to ask Angelina <laughs> to talk to me a little bit about leadership and community. Thank you, Nicoletta. So I'll start, but I'm sure the others always have something to fill in. Um, I think if you look at what I think Rebecca and Winnie mentioned earlier on, so the book has contributions from African people living with HIV, but it also has contributions from our allies. But if you look at a lot of the contributions from the African people living with HIV within the book, I think you will see that actually a lot of them have been living with HIV for a long time. They came from a position whereby, you know, when you're newly diagnosed and things are quite overwhelming, they've sorted out, not sorted out, but they've managed to cope with their diagnosis. But a lot of them have then gone on to start organizations, to start groups. A lot of them have not done, there's a lot of leadership that's been going in each and every story. And I don't know whether it's by default or what, but actually, if you read all the different stories, you'll find there's an element of leadership within each and every story. And we didn't set it out to do it that way, but it just happened that when we were talking to people, when we were interviewing them, and then, because a lot of times when I was, some, okay, when we ask people to contribute, we gave them an option to either answer the, uh, a number of questions. They could either write, write in, email in, or we could interview them. And a lot of these people, some of them we've known them for a long time, but when I was doing some of the interviews, and I'm sure it's the same for the other co-authors, is I discovered so many things about people, so many things that they had done over the years, so much that they had overcome, so much resilience that they had. So there was a huge, I mean, I don't wanna spoil it for the readers, but almost every single contributor in that book had some leadership qualities within them. And that was just incredible to see. And these are, these are just a few people. So these are a few people we managed to speak to. Can you imagine how much leadership exists out there that we'd never hear about. So it was important to actually highlight that, but it was great that it actually just happened by default. So I'm sure other people have things to add to that. Thank you. Anyone else who has something to add when it comes to leadership? How do we build leadership as women? Well, I, I was going to add that um, the other side of leadership is the fact that we have led on producing a book that's the first of its kind um, speaks volumes to the fact that there is leadership, even within our own communities, even as well, women, um, and we're quite good at it. We can be good at, you know, at leadership <clears throat> if we're given the opportunity to. So, you know, even just producing the first book of its kind um, reflects a certain leadership. Absolutely. I think I'll let Winnie go because Rebecca just said what I was going to say. So you go, Winnie. I'll lower my hand. Okay, Winnie, okay. Talking about leadership, memory getting in the... <laughs> well done, you, memory. Uh, I think part, you know, for me, leadership, of course, there are so many different, you know, qualities, so many different things, but the ability to collaborate with others. It was so important for us to be able to write this book together. Because as Rebecca mentioned, we have a lot of different skills within us. Uh, and of course, you know, we, we've been networking, you know, forever. And we, we know, you know, we knew all of these people. We had lists of people that we could, co you know, contact more than 100 people. But we had to put a limit to, you know, to the number that uh, we wanted in the book to be able to... Um, 
to, to fit in with the 40th anniversary of, of, you know, of HIV being identified in the UK. But there was something also quite unique about us doing this together. We've been friends, mm -hmm. you know, this was building on our friendship, uh, on our, you know, working together in the community, working with others. And again, that sense of community, that collaboration, that, you know, and we, you know, as a leader, you do not have to be a director, a CEO. You can lead, you know, in so many different ways. So for me, you know, um, this book wouldn't have come together if so many of these things weren't in place already. Uh, our friendship, uh, how we respect each other, uh, the knowledge we have about each other in terms of our skills and being able to really um, do things together and put anything else aside and, and make sure something like this could be produced. Thank you. Memory. Okay, uh, I mean, I was just going to talk as well, like Winnie said, is, is our friendship. I mean, amongst us, we've got uh, over a century, I think probably 120, 130 years of lived HIV experience. We did start, we met and we've been together for about maybe close to 20 years now. So we're much younger when we started. And now we are just something else, which I won't go into. Aging gracefully. Disgracefully, right? Yes. No. They're gracefully. seasoned. Yes. <laughs> you see, they're starting right? already. <laughs> yeah. So I think our friendship as well, and we, I think we have actually empowered each other along the way to be able to be who we are. I mean, I was diagnosed when I didn't know my anything about HIV. But they're going to places like, uh, you know, support groups where I met some of these people here. It's just, that's how I got empowered and decided that I wanted to live. So if it wasn't for this friendship and the way we have been involved from, from way back into different organizations, different networks, different engagements, we probably would have been wondering what to do with, you know, with each other if we if weren't uh, such good friends. And among the way, we have met women who are stronger than us and we have worked and like trying to work and gain as much knowledge as we can from other people who, I mean, we, we don't know everything and the other people who know a lot more than us. I mean, the people, some of the people in our book are highly, highly respected people in the HIV sector that we, even ourselves were like, wow, you said yes, they said yes. So it's just, you know, you, you just have this buzz like, okay, we need to do this well. So I think it's just, you know, we are women. I mean, women are all leaders. Once you are a, a, a woman, you have looked after people, you are a leader already you know, in my eyes. So however you manage your, your children, your, your family, you are a leader already. So just having to share our experiences you know, with other women and other people, we think will make that impact on women. There are women who come to you and say, oh my God, I didn't know that about you. Or, okay, I've read your book or heard you, you speak. How do I write my story? Like, do we do a volume two <laughs> or what? But we can never have enough of people. So, so it's like encouraging people maybe to write within their communities. And it's something in one of our future plans, which I think we know Angelina or Rebecca will talk about. But I'll stop here. So can I just quickly add also in terms of the leadership, one of the things that enabled us to also go forward, there are many things, but I think we had a lot of passion and a lot of commitment for the book to get it done because we really, the thing is, once we decided we were going to do it, we were going to do it. There was nothing was going to stop us. We were going to do it, however long it was going to take. And we were all 110% committed to doing it. And I think just, I think for me personally, working on this book with this, I'll call them amazing women. The fact that we're still talking is another story altogether. But I think just being able to work on a project where everybody believes in the same thing, where everybody has the same passion, everybody has the same commitment. It was a labor of love and a lot of tears and blood were shed along the way. <laughs> but I just think it's one of those things that, um, and, and, and I'll allude to what Memory said, there was also a lot of goodwill along the way. The list that Winnie mentioned where we had a lot of people, we said, okay, we'll contact them, we'll contact them. 
and and people people said yes people believed in us before they even knew what it was even going to look like and i think when people have that much faith in you it can, it can only motivate you to do even better so yeah, i think the passion the commitment the motivation and the goodwill from so many people really really helped us along the way that's amazing anyone else who wants to add something on this yeah. i'd like to okay go on i was just gonna say i think it's been well articulated <laughs> yeah yeah very powerful statements from all of you can i learn a little bit more about the power of storytelling what what it is about telling uh, um because uh, telling our own stories to strangers, what does it do for what we want to achieve in um, in the long term? Is it really important still today that we share with people when uh, we have been uh, diagnosed with HIV, um, our experience of stigma? Is, it, or is that something that becomes almost a, a cliche of who we are? by repeating the same story? Is that still power and um, gravitas in uh, in telling stories? There is. Yeah. Oh, shall I start and then maybe hand over to Charity? Yeah, yeah? Okay. shall I start? There is still so, first of all, I think it's already alluded to, everybody has a story in them. There's still a huge power and they're still incredibly important to tell our stories. Even though we've been telling our stories for the past 10, 20, 30 years, you tell your, every time you tell your story, you tell it in a different way. Yeah. Because it depends on who you're telling it to, who the audience are. If I'm telling my story to a newly diagnosed woman, I will tell it in a different way. If I'm telling my story to healthcare clinicians, I'm going to tell it in a different way. So you change, you learn to change your story over the years. But telling stories is how, even as African communities, if you think back, in the olden days, our ancestors, our grand great grandparents, our grandparents always used to sit under the big baobab tree and tell stories and hand down stories from generation to generation. So we are doing it in a different medium now, but stories are incredibly important because it's for me, it's when I had somebody else's story that keeps me going. And I'm sure somebody else picks up the book, reads it. It's by, it's by reading a story that you can identify with that person in the story. So I think we can never stop telling stories, but I'll stop because I'm sure other people have things to add to that. <laughs> I think I'll talk about, um, I'll just take a moment to talk about the vital role, about the support and friendship, because if it wasn't for that, for me, I, won't, I was not going to be able to tell my story. So I personally, if it wasn't for these women here around me, I wouldn't be able to tell my story. So I was fortunate to be part of that group, this group like uh, of friends who met through peer support. So that way, I gained strength, I gained confidence to tell my story. And then I always tell my story in different ways, like Angelina says, we all do that. But for me, the way I tell the story is to speak for others through, uh, like, uh, let me just say, as a poster girl for, to, for, or for, as a poster girl for people to see that I am positive and uh, here I am. But you, you know, each, each one of us has got their own uh, time to tell their stories. But I'm just glad I told my so story th through the book as well. Thank Hello. you. I don't know. I was just going to add the charity is so right. Um, I think for each of us here, hearing somebody else's story um, was the catalyst. That's what changed the course of your life with regard to HIV. Um, and then for us, what that does, it's representation, it's empowerment for other women. If you stand up and tell your story, then people can think, okay, there are other women. Even if they don't tell their story, they go away feeling a little bit empowered. Um, within storytelling, there's 
a cultural connection, there's a pride. Each of us, even though we have walked the journey of HIV, each has a very different kind of story, um, a different kind of journey. And so, you know, within that, we bring different cultures, different connections, different elements of being a Zambian or being a, a Kenyan or a Zimbabwe, we each bring our own stories. So I think that's really powerful. Um, and it's good to be able to share this with the community, the wider community, and you know, share the experiences are really important. And that comes through storytelling. Well, yeah. Let's just add uh, that as well, that you know, storytelling has also evolved. I remember earlier uh, when I was uh, earlier in you know, yeah earlier the earlier years of my journey i remember going to a group where i was going to talk about uh, hiv to a non hiv group and i got there and then uh, talked about you know what hiv is blah, not the usual blah 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 and then at the end i just said okay and the person i'm talking about is actually me because i'm living with hiv the way people's faces change they start offering you cups of tea <laughs> Are you okay? Do you need anything? Do you need any water? So I mean, this <laughs> is that is another way. And then just doesn't end there. The people in uh, uh, looking for you outside the meeting, trying to find like you know they say, oh, but you look so well. How I mean, how do you live with HIV? I did an interview a long time ago on a CNN for World Days Day. My phone didn't stop ringing from schoolmates, people I've knew in Zimbabwe. Who are like people just know where you are or email you like, oh my God, are you sure? And how do you live? Something like the question is, how do you look so well living with HIV? You know, how do you manage it so well? I mean, some people are quite, you know, curious to understand. And then you say, no, 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 you know, I just take my medication and being having a positive attitude. Okay, okay. Oh, by the way, I'm also living with HIV, but uh, mm -hmm. it's only, I've just only told you and uh, my, my, my healthcare mm -hmm. team that no. And I uh, said, okay. That's fine. It's your, you know, it's your choice, and uh, I'm here to support you if you need anything. And there's a friend who has lived with HIV now, I think, for about twelve years. If she sees me on Facebook saying I'm attending the Glasgow conference, the first thing when I get back is, is there any new, is there anything new for us? <laughs> I always find it quite fun. It's like almost standard. <laughs> so it's like there's some nice humor in in storytelling, but you know that you know whatever you're doing somebody else is benefiting and getting empowered. So you can never stop telling uh, uh, telling stories, which is quite a, a positive thing, I think, for anyone else that you know needs your support. So yeah, that's where I'll stop. Can I uh, add yeah, something on that? Mm -hmm. Like uh, uh -huh. in the context of our book, uh, our stories living, uh, our stories told by us, we also emphasize the importance of these uh, connections, you know, each story shared within its uh, pages illustrated how our collective experience shape our identities and strengthens our communities by sharing our narratives. Uh, we we not only validate our own journeys but also um, create pathways for others to find their own stories. Thank you. That's what I wanted to add. Sorry, go on. Can I can I add yeah. just to echo most of what everybody has said? Really, um, that life is about stories. Really, um, mm -hmm. you know, even when you watch the news, you know what jumps out of you know for you. It's about people's stories. You know mm -hmm. who's doing what and where. I think what we did differently, and this was very intentional is that we tapped into our own cultural, you know, um, cultural uh, sort of um, um, history, basically, around story, uh, around storytelling. Uh, but what is different now is that we wanted to capture the stories because the oral stories are dying out. We wanted to make sure these stories were documented there is a document to show people's stories, how they told them, you know, in their own words. These are not edited. We didn't go, no. you know, to a journalist or say, we told everyone, tell it as you feel, as you know how to say it. 
and you know and we edited very very little and that is different but also the group of people who told their stories these stories haven't been told never they haven't been heard and i think that is why this book is extremely special um and also i think it taps into what um actually the recent black history month was about it was about um black african narratives reclaiming our narratives reclaiming our narratives making sure that history is written down about us because there are a lot of places where our history has been erased yeah. so for us this is a lot you know there's a lot tied up to this book and it is extremely unique it's very special and i hope that everybody gets a, a copy especially those who are here today <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Can we, as we are almost to the end of this uh, webinar, can we hear something uh, that you have written? Can someone read something from this magic book? Well, oh. memory and Angelina, since you have copies to hand. <laughs> okay. Mm. You go, Angelina. All right. I am going to read... Um... Here we go. I'm going to read because we mentioned a little bit about stigma. So I'll read just um, a longish paragraph about stigma, but also where we've come to here. Yeah? Um, so this is titled, There is no pill for stigma. Knowledge is power and we need effective health communication and information. We need to spread facts, not fear. We have a fantastic range of treatments that enable people living with HIV to lead regular lives. We also now have the concept of you equals you. However, we still haven't got a pill to tackle stigma and this is what is killing our communities. More efforts therefore need to be put into addressing self and societal stigma in order that we can reach a point whereby we have zero new infections, zero HIV related deaths and zero HIV related stigma. It is important to note too that we have the concept of you, that the concept of you equals you alone will not solve the issue of stigma. We need a comprehensive set of holistic services and ongoing research into all the relevant treatment and prevention methods in order for us to reach the UNAIDS 95, 95, 95, 95 targets. Not forgetting the fourth 95, which is quality of life, because people living with HIV are more than an undetectable viral load. We have lives. Thank you. Thank you. That is really, I don't know how to describe it, but really you moved me. I I remember reading this the first time and um, and I felt really, really empowered. I just felt that, yeah, every single word meant exactly what I wanted other people to, to hear and to learn. Memory, do you want to read something uh, from from the book? Memory, you should read a poem. Oh, yes. I was, I was thinking the same. Yeah. Okay, let me find it. Sorry, I was, I'd given up. I thought it was just, a, okay. And while memory is trying to find the page, I think it's important just to add on to the point Winnie was making about being intentional. We were also very intentional in making sure that despite some of the stories being quite sad, there was a, there's a good feel about yes. the book. You know, it wasn't sad. There were some very interesting bits. There were funny bits. There were, you know, the idea was that people come out with a positive, um, you know, outlook when you live with HIV. Age 68, Mem, if you found, haven't found it. Yes, yeah. Oh. The poem is called, If You Need Me. If you need me, I'll be the family you choose. If you need me, tell me. Talk to me. I may not have all the answers, but I am ready to listen. If you need me, I'll be your sounding board. Don't hesitate to call. Sharing is caring after all. If you need me, I'll be there any time of the day, morning, noon, or night. 
just pick up the phone and WhatsApp me. My phone is permanently on silent. Somebody there. If you need me, I'll give you cuddles and happiness. Hold your hand and be there for you. I will not judge you for who you are. You'll always be my friends. If you need me, I'll be there. Like that very famous Diana Ross song. I'll be there. I'll be there. I'll be there. I'm not a good singer. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. That again was really powerful and moving at the same time. We only have uh, a few minutes left uh, and I'd like uh, each of you, because um, I really want as many people as possible, as I said already, to buy the book. Think about, you know, the, the audience being um, a Europe-wide audience. So women uh, and men for that matter, that they might not have the luxury of living in the UK when it comes to health and social care. So what would be the sort of um, the message uh, from each of you to all of us, uh, audience uh, and readers who want to learn uh, from your book? What shall we take away? Memory, I'll start from you simply because you're the biggest screen. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my message to everyone is be, uh, oh, my, oh, okay, I'll start again. My message to everyone is there's always somebody to listen to your story. There's always somebody who can identify with you. There's always support from everybody around you living with HIV. Get the book. Thank you. Rebecca? Okay, so for me, I would say there is life after HIV. And all you have to do is read the stories. And if you can't read them, you, you know, to get a copy, you'd have to go to Amazon or to Barnes and Noble in America. But you can also get it on Kindle so you can listen to it. But I think the key message is there is life after HIV. Thank you. Winnie? Uh, I would say that um, um, it is important for, for people living with HIV to live well. Treatment is fantastic. But without a support network, it's it's almost impossible to, to be able to, to live your full life. Uh, make sure you get a support network around you and that will be different at different stages of your life but it is extremely important and my support network are these wonderful ladies and look at what we did mm -hmm. so get that support network going <laughs> thank you charity I think again, you're on mute, Charity. Hi, uh, talking about support network. Um, I think our friendship has blossomed from whatever we were when we were diagnosed and we are living well with HIV. So for those who are not sure about their health like Winnie said look at us but I would also say um, to them if they cannot get any support they should get this book because this book is to inspire others to tell their stories and it's important for it's important but also a healing book Thank you. Angelina? <laughs> it's very interesting what Rebecca said because that's what I had noted down. But what I would say is, firstly, you're not alone. This The book will show you that you're not alone. Mm -hmm. It will show you that there is life after HIV. With access to treatment, to care and support, you can live your best life. And you can even write your own book. The book is not only engaging, it's very beautiful and it will look very nice either on your coffee table or on your shelf. 
but uh, it will keep you going for many nights. And you don't have to read it all in one go. You can read a story at a time, a story at a day. But yeah, you will um, you'll find yourself in that book somewhere. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely true. And I sometimes go back to one specific story or a bit of a story that is um, a kind of reminder for myself uh, that different stages in uh, even during, you know, the same week, going back to the book, there is always something different, something new that appeals to, to me. And, uh, and that's why I want everyone really to, to read this book because it's incredibly powerful. But talking about this book, I just want to, to know what's next. What, what are you plotting? Is there anything else? Are we thinking of a movie? Is there something else coming uh, from uh, your <laughs> powerful yeah. minds and souls? Do you know anyone who can direct a movie, Nicoletta? <laughs> Please do tell. Please do tell. Nicoletta, we're always plotting. Of course, we're always plotting. Hello. Been a year um since the book was published and 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 I think it was already alluded to earlier on. Mm. We wrote the book, but we also wanted to inspire other people to write their own stories. So what we'd like to do, I'll mention one of the things we really want to do going forwards is to showcase the book further, but also we want to start doing workshops uh, with communities to creative writing workshops so that they can also start writing their own stories. So that's one of the things we are going to be doing. So watch this space. And would these uh, creative workshops happen uh, online or would they happen in person? Because I'm already thinking EATG Women uh, Converse would benefit from uh, your wisdom and your hearts and uh, creative workshops uh, online. They're not the same, but they're, uh, they're able to reach many more women. I mean, I that's the subject yeah. open to, right, Rebecca? Yeah. Open yeah. To that. Open. We'll do both, but yeah. Rebecca, go on. No, I was just going to say, we're, we're, you know, it's subject to conversation. We were very good at meeting people where they are very often. So, you know, if it requires us to be online, we, we could, you know, do it online. If it requires us to be in person, um, funding permitting, obviously, yeah, we're quite happy to, we're quite amenable. And also, um, if you have like a, an EATG women's conference or seminar or symposium, that we could come and do a workshop within that. Very happy. I mean, there's always, as Rebecca is saying, we can talk about stuff. Thank you. Mm. I'm afraid we kind of uh, reached the end of the time together, but is there really one word that you want to um, to leave us with that will, um, for those, uh, as I said, this is recorded, so people will hear uh, what we have been discussing and hopefully buy the book. What is in one word, uh, considering that we are really at the end of our time together? Why this book? Why now? Because it's power. <laughs> okay. Mm. We need because it is resilience in one word. <laughs> Absolutely true. Yeah. Okay. Because it's healing. Wow, well, it's true. It's true. Everything you've been saying so far is really what have experienced reading the book. So who's that memory? It's uh, it's your peer support uh, toolkit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's motivational. Yes. Just get the book. <laughs> yes. Okay. We end with this message loud and clear. Get the book. <laughs> The authors are change makers and troublemakers, and the book will change your life. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's been a gift, as always, to be in your company. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you for having us. us. Thank, Thank you. you.